Good morning and welcome. Thank you for connecting as we continue in our study of a few books of the Bible. Today we will um, look at the epistles written by Apostle Peter. We'll start with First Peter. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Um, okay, anyone on the call, if you could kindly begin us. Uh, start out with a word of prayer that would be really nice and then we can go into the study shall we pray yes. Heavenly Father I want to say thank you this morning thank you because you are the almighty God thank you for your powerful resurrection be thou glorified in the name of Jesus Lord, we commit our lecture today into your hands, and we commit our lecture into your hands and the rest of our students. Father, let your power of Holy Spirit fall on us in the name of Jesus. Thank you because you are wonderful. Let your power of resurrection fall on us in the name of Jesus. As we study your word, Father, let your word be impact in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Success. Um, okay, let's get into uh, I know there's a question, comment on the chat. I will address it at the end of the class. Um, but for now, let's just get into our study. So coming to the writings of Peter and first Peter the authorship of the epistles is by uh, Peter. And that's uh, pretty clear. There's no ambiguity uh, as uh, we had in the book of Hebrews, where we were wondering who the writer could have been. But uh, this is quite clear that Peter has written because he begins by saying apostle, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So that was the standard way of uh, writing letters. And uh, so Peter is the author of the book. Now we can also recognize that Peter probably took the help of Silas. So uh, Peter wrote this uh, letter with the help of Silas. Uh, why, uh, we may ask, uh, the reason could be that he was but a fisherman. And in comparison to a learned person like Apostle Paul, he was not so much of an author or a writer. So he may have needed some support to actually write out uh, these letters. And uh, when we look at the content, I'm giving you a very broad uh, summary and outline, uh, we, we see that the content contains some important doctrines. It also contains um, some instructions for the right kind of Christian life that one must live. And uh, there is emphasis on duties as well. Uh, in relationships, in the settings where God has placed us, how must we behave, how how must we um, live the Christian life. So uh, these are the themes that run through the epistle. So we have doctrines, we have Christian life, and we have duties. So there are two um, epistles. We are only talking about the first episode for now, we will go to the second episode. In the second episode, there is more of a warning uh, regarding false prophets and false ministers of God. And the second book talks uh, of uh, themes similar to the book of Jude. So Jude and Second Peter are quite similar. Uh, they carry warnings, but the first episode has uh, teachings about doctrines, Christian life, and duties. Now, when was this book actually written? We can date it to as early as 67 to 69 AD, around the time when some of the apostles were still alive and they were being martyred. So this is a, an early book, just like Jude. It's an early book. How do we know? Because in the Greek uh, present tense that 
the book is written in, there are references to temple sacrifices and temple practices. So then we know that the uh, destruction of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem happened in AD 70. So this has to be before because the temple still existed. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we can therefore confidently state that it's an early book and it was written before the destruction of the temple. So um, the date would be somewhere between 67 to 69 AD. Uh, looking at the literary form of this epistle, it is a letter. It's a letter. So it has an introduction, salutation, goes on into the body of the letter and closes off with uh, greetings uh, and thanksgiving blessings towards the end of the letter. Now, who was it written to? It was written to the people that Peter ministered to. And uh, uh, these people were spread out in the region of Asia Minor. So it was not necessarily to one particular church, but to a region ha that had people, believers, whom Peter had ministered to earlier. And the category of the believers, as we saw in the book of Hebrews, he was primarily addressing the persecuted Jews. And therefore, he uh, talked so much about temple practices. And there, were, there was terminology that they were aware of that came from their understanding of uh, the early books of the Bible. But in the writings of Peter, it's easy to understand for both the Jews and the Gentiles. And he addressed it to both the categories of people who had become believers during those times. So now we could ask the question, what is the purpose of the letter? There must be some purpose why he wrote. So uh, he wanted to teach the believers just the way James also wanted to teach the believers uh, about um, the right way to relate with one another uh, and uh, you know how uh, how uh, one must manage their speech how one must uh, uh, speak rightly so there are certain instructions that james wanted to bring to the people of the congregation for peter it was about instructing them to live a righteous life, instructing them to live a um, godly life in the midst of persecution. Because Peter knew that they were already under persecution, you know, right from the book of Acts, when he made his first sermon, uh, the uh, first few chapters, we see that they were taken to stand before the council. Uh, and so persecution was very much there. Uh, and persecution was increasing. People had spread out because of persecution. Even now, he's speaking to the dispersion of the believers in the Asia Minor region. So persecution is there, but he anticipated a heightening of the persecution under the rule of Emperor Nero. And so he wanted to prepare the hearts of the people uh, about the right kind of Christian life that they must live in the midst of the rising persecution. So that is the purpose of him writing the letter. And we um, see that uh, as he talks about persecution, as he talks about bearing up under the pressure of persecution, just like the writer of the Hebrews, Hebrews 12, we know that uh, the writer says, uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So Jesus is our uh, example and our pattern. Peter does the same thing. He wants us to focus in on Jesus because unless we imitate the life of Christ, we would not know how we must live our lives. So the life of Jesus is our best example of how we must live even when we are uh, not uh, accepted, even when we are mocked for our faith, even when we are going through opposition and difficulties uh, on account of our faith. So Jesus is the example that Peter also points us to. So let's begin with chapter 1 now. As we've been doing lately, I would request us to please go ahead and read out the entire chapter. Um, the chapter does have 
25 verses. So a good thing to do would probably be to read half. Uh, one person can read half the chapter and another person the remaining half. So 12 verses for the first person and 13 verses for the second person. So um, yeah, students on our call, if you could kindly unmute and read these two sections, we'll, we'll move on from there. Peter, Peter, chapter 1, verse 1. OK, uh, Rosalind, yes, you can continue. And uh, Brother Lubega, you can pick up the same. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things angels desire to look into. Amen. 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 Therefore, grind up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not confirming yourself to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Because it's written, be holy for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your sojourning here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the script, the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, seed but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as flower of the grass. The grass withers, and it, its flowers falls away, 
but the word of God endures forever. Now, this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Lubega. Uh, let's now go ahead and we will understand what we have uh, read here. Uh, as we could see, uh, initially, you know, there is a greeting and then there is a definite pointing to the identity of the believer, who the believer really is, and calling the believer to a heavenly perspective in the midst of what they are going through here on earth. And then he goes on to emphasizing a holy living that uh, is evident as you know uh, in this world so not just in in our spiritual sense to be holy sanctified by god but in our behavior in our lifestyle how that must actually come through and uh, uh, then he uh, it reminds us about the power of the word of God. So that broadly uh, covers the themes running through chapter one, but we will look at it in a little bit more of detail. So the introduction, uh, the name of Peter is mentioned and his calling is mentioned. So it's nice to know that uh, Peter had come to the understanding uh, of what God wanted for him to do. And uh, Peter, uh, knew that he had an apostolic calling and he's boldly declaring that and saying Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ he was sent by uh, Christ Jesus that's what an apostle is uh, one who is sent from someone else and so by Jesus Peter was sent as an apostle and he says to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, uh, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So these regions are in Asia Minor, and uh, dispersion simply means uh, those are those who are spread out. They are spread out, and uh, pilgrims is usually a term referred to a stranger who comes from a foreign land or a city uh, seeking a religious encounter. You know, or or um, they have a religious agenda in mind where they want to go and worship. So they are strangers who have come to worship. And he's calling the believers as pilgrims uh, in keeping with the reality that though we are here on earth, though we are in the world, we are not of the world. And uh, with that uh, concept in, in his mind, uh, he says, you are pilgrims. We know that Apostle Paul talks about it. He says, we are truly citizens of heaven. We are citizens of heaven. And there are other terms we find in um, uh, the writings of Paul where uh, the believer is seen as an ambassador of Christ. We are representatives of a heavenly kingdom. And uh, uh, that is why even Peter is calling the believers as pilgrims. He's saying, this is not our permanent place. We are uh, from heaven. We are born of God. And uh, uh, there is also what we call as sojourning, uh, sojourning or journeying here on earth. And that's what pilgrims do. They are journeying uh, with their with their spiritual agenda in mind. And that is who we are as believers. We need to have a greater heavenly perspective. Now, this does not mean that we should be earthly unwise. Uh, there is an APC publication as well that talks about being spiritually minded and earthly wise. And Jesus told us that, uh, you know, we must be sharp uh, as um, uh, serpents, but harmless as doves. So wisdom in our earthly living is equally important. But we recognize our identity. We are born of God. And uh, uh, therefore, that must take pre precedence uh, that we are actually uh, of the kingdom of God. We belong to a spiritual kingdom more than anything else. Now, verse 2, he says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. So he is uh, proclaiming the position of the believer. Again, he earlier said you are pilgrims. Now he's saying you are elect. What does elect mean? Elect uh, comes from the Greek uh, term uh, eklektos, which means chosen or picked up. 
we have been picked up by god uh, now i know we can go into the argument of um, you know uh, pre uh, predestination and all of that but we have already established that predestination doesn't mean that god has uh, chosen some and eliminated the others uh, from being part of his family that's not what predestination means because the same bible also talks about whosoever uh, shall believe whosoever will will come uh, and so it's a choice uh, that has been given salvation is a choice and when one makes that choice you know uh, we we can come into this category of the elect but then the choice is open to everyone so the elect meaning the chosen uh, are uh, the you, the believers they are called by the lord why are they being called as chosen uh, because it's a special calling it's a special calling and uh, uh, we must recognize it it's a privilege uh, to be part of the family of god and the kingdom of god so we are the elect and he again talks about foreknowledge of god the father simply means that god already knew who would make that choice uh, not that you know god uh, intentionally pushed some people into the choice and some outside that's that's not what it means so god knew who would make that choice to come into his family in sanctification of the spirit uh, it shows us that there is a work of purification that the holy spirit does in us you know when we read about um, uh, the baptism in the holy spirit uh, we know a this uh, john the baptist you know he refers to it as the there, there is one who who is coming after me who is greater than me who will baptize you in holy spirit and fire he says so spirit sanctification of the spirit right and john the baptist said holy spirit and fire so there is a connection of the holy spirit baptism uh, and fire and we know that the the work of fire is purification uh, and fire will burn up the chaff so there is a work of cleansing that the holy spirit does in the life of a believer when we yield to the holy spirit and uh, much more when we are baptized in the holy spirit that the fleshly parts of us will be burnt up which is why you know we also uh, encourage to pray in the spirit to uh, be filled with the spirit to walk in the spirit because there is a sanctification that uh, we will experience as we are yielding ourselves to the work of the spirit so he's talking about what the position of the believer and the work of god in the life of a believer and in this case through the spirit of god sanctification takes place in us by the spirit of god and he says for the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of jesus christ so he uh, simply is talking about uh, uh, believers consecrating themselves uh, walking in the ways of the lord committing themselves to what god calls them to do and he is talking about sprinkling of blood what is the meaning of that you know sprinkling of blood is also a term that was closely associated with cleansing it was closely associated with dedication consecration because we know sprinkling was usually done at the time of establishing covenants uh, in the old testament uh, sprinkling was done at the time of uh, uh dedicating someone for a godly purpose such as Aaron and his sons they were dedicated to be high priests and at that time sprinkling was done so they were ordained ordination uh, is is uh, you know another um, uh, process in which we see the sprinkling of the blood and uh, basically purification and even in some of the rituals of the cleansing of the leper uh, sprinkling was was done and so the understanding is a cleansing again cleansing of the believer so here we are we understand our identity in christ and we understand what god is doing in us so he's doing a work of cleansing he's doing a work of preparing us as the chosen of the lord we are being sanctified we are being cleansed um, for the lord we are being set apart for the lord and uh, peter is reminding the people that look you're not you're in the world you're definitely not of the world there's a different life that god is calling us to do and a life that he himself is empowering us to live and then 
he begins with a blessing. He says, grace to you and peace be multiplied. I mean, tell me who doesn't want grace, who doesn't want peace? You know, we, we want more of it all the time because grace enables to do what God calls us to do. And every day, you know, as a believer, as a person in the ministry, I'm sure, you know, we are praying these prayers and saying, Lord, please give me more grace, you know, to do what you're calling me to do. More peace. Who doesn't want more peace? We want shalom, wholeness, uh, spirit, soul, and body, the abundance of Christ in our lives. So he's blessing the people, the believers, and he's saying, come on, may you have more grace, may you have more peace. And we can make that a prayer and say, yes, Lord, we want more grace, more peace in our lives. And uh, why is he using this uh, form of uh, salutation? Because we see those in the Greek culture. And, uh, you know, you, you would notice that even towards the end of his writing, he'll say, increase in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that, that was cultural uh, in, in the Greek and Jewish culture. And so uh, in the Greek, more of grace, they would talk about grace. Uh, in the Jewish, they would talk more about shalom. And so he's combining the two. And he is blessing the believers. And then he goes on to talk about the greatness of our God. And, you know, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So, uh, you see, we mentioned that he's going to talk about persecution and how to be ready for persecution. But there is something about being rooted in our identity, being rooted in who we are in Christ. And uh, seems like even Peter understood the value of that, where he's reminding the believer time and again, don't you know you are of God? Don't you know you are cleansed? And now he's saying, uh, don't you know you are born of God? You're begotten. God has begotten us. And he's also bringing a spark of hope. Okay, uh, Because he's talking about resurrection. And uh, we've just... Uh, we've just uh, worshipped the Lord uh, on Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, uh, as many of us call it. And, you know, it's it's uh, such great hope to know that our God is alive. And uh, it's all about hope. Resurrection is about life. It's about hope. And uh, even before he talks about persecution, he's reminding the believer, hey, don't you know that Jesus rose from the dead and uh, have hope? In, in our hearts, the struggles that we are going through, the deadness that Jesus experienced was not the end. He rose from the dead. And that shows us that uh, no matter what struggles we are, we are going to face, there is hope at the end of a dark tunnel. And that is our calling. You know, That is the hope with which every believer lives. He says, living hope through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a, it's a positive note on which the letter is starting. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, every reason for the believers to be excited because our gospel is about life. Our gospel is about hope. Uh, and our gospel is about the victory that our God has won over uh, every destruction of the enemy. And again, another note, a high note uh, to cause us to rejoice. He says, don't you know there is an inheritance waiting for you? Uh, even when we go through all these struggles in, in our lives, don't worry. There is something ahead of us which is so beautiful. Remember, even in the book of Hebrews, uh, that's what we were told. Uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We are looking forward to something. And because we are looking forward to something, enduring what we are going through right now becomes, uh, uh, you know, it makes it makes sense uh, to, to not be grumbling, to not give up. Because there's something ahead of us which is much more beautiful. So again, a note of hope. He gave us hope uh, by talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now he's saying there is an inheritance. And what kind of inheritance? So beautiful. He says incorruptible, undefiled, which means that it is, uh, it is um, uh, you know, incorruptible stands for something which will not be destroyed. Uh, undefiled stands for something which is pure. And God is giving us that kind of an inheritance. And he also says it will not fade away. And uh, to 
<laughs> add to our joy reserved in heaven for you which means nobody else will take it away so these are all things that should make us happy as believers uh, resurrection of christ there is something i can look forward to the reward of god waiting for me uh, and so you know uh, god is keeping us god is helping us so uh, keep your faith in god that's the point that he's trying to drive home here now in the following section again there's encouragement because he knows that uh, troubled times are happening right now more troubled times to come so uh, he encourages them to hold on to their faith and let's see what he says about that faith no he says um, you greatly rejoice though now for a little while if need be you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to praise honor and glory at the revelation of jesus christ okay so he is reminding the believer and he's saying look though we go through all kinds of trials uh there is something precious that we carry and that is our faith and he's saying genuineness of our faith you know that real faith that trusts in god that hopes in god he is uh, reminding us that it is more precious than gold and he says that perishes because in the culmination of things we know that gold is a precious metal and it doesn't get corroded right like we depend on gold like yeah okay it's one of those precious metals that we can rely on it's it's way better than all the other metals that exist but we know that at the end of time the whole earth will be reformed as we saw in uh, the book of hebrews where god will just even the heavens god is just going to roll it away like a cloak so even when those things disappear the so called precious things of the world there is something that remains and we carry that what is that our faith genuine faith in god he says it's more precious more precious than the precious gold which may not even last right and when when we are tested when we go through all kinds of trials now let's be clear when we talk about tests in scripture we are not talking about god putting us through sickness okay we're not uh, talking about you know god intentionally putting us through um, uh, some form of oppression does sickness happen to believers it does it does uh, you know oppression of the evil one happen to believers it does but god is not intentionally putting it on us and we have to be very clear about that so when he says trials uh, tests trials uh, there there are there are things that we go through where uh, you know our faith gets proved so one classic test that we can go back to is of course the test that abraham went through when you know he was asked to sacrifice his son isaac the only son he had waited for him his 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 life is about waiting for that that promised child and here he's going through a test where god is saying okay come on um, how about you sacrifice your son isaac and look at the the faith of abraham we read in the book of romans that he he had faith in god right he was a man of faith we read in the book of hebrews that he even believed that god could raise him from the dead and the promise of god will never be lost and so that is the precious faith and god commended it way you know hundreds of years after abraham lived and died he's gone but god is talking about the faith of abraham because that's how much god you know loves faith faith pleases god and the genuineness of our faith is what the lord wants so if we can if we can have faith in our difficult times in our tests trials mostly to do with uh, you know oppositions that come our way persecutions that come our way um, we know how can we go through all this and keep still keep our faith because we have a heavenly perspective all the things in the world yeah today we are going through it but ultimately you know Our, our faith will remain ultimately there is a reward we are waiting for and uh, god himself will preserve us and in that last portion there of uh, verse 8 
he says uh, though now you do not see him yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory receiving the end of your faith the salvation of your souls so there will come a time where you know we are going to walk into the fullness of these things right now we may not uh, see jesus face to face but with the hope of all these things which are yet to come uh, we are rejoicing okay joy inexpressible and full of glory now, sometimes we've got to ask ourselves you know do do we really experience that right now and we carry that joy that rejoicing in our hearts uh, uh, today it's there and tomorrow it will be greater when we see our lord jesus christ face to face so you know, he's basically we could say giving perspective to the believer come on believer uh, you're actually not of this earth so don't worry these trials are temporary now moving on to verse 10 here he says of this salvation he's talking about salvation which the believers are experiencing but he's saying the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you so he's reminding the believers look right now we are carrying something precious but do we understand that even those who spoke about these things we have all these mighty prophets of god uh, jeremiah isaiah you know ezekiel uh, you have the uh, micah zechariah talk about all the prophets of god and even in their writings in their prophetic words now we can see uh, the the direction they're pointing to christ they're pointing to the ultimate fulfillment which would be the lord jesus christ we've talked about this in the book of hebrews right that uh, everything that happened before was just a shadow of the actual fulfillment that happened in and through our lord jesus christ so even when these prophets were speaking they had no idea of the fullness of the salvation that you and i would taste right now and we right now are so blessed because they only knew bits and pieces right uh, but the actual things were revealed in the new testament so there are a couple of references ephesians 3 verses 4 to 6 and second timothy chapter 1 verse 10 it also tell us that the prophets did not fully understand the work of the gospel as revealed to us right now in the new testament so it's a privilege we now have a privilege with us and uh, you know they talk they talked about um, the sufferings of christ the glories that would follow um, and uh, not in wholeness they did not know everything fully but they gave us some pointers towards that okay great so that's like the essence of uh, those scriptures still verse 12 and uh, because of this because of what we have because of the great hope that we have because of the inheritance that we have that we are looking forward to the fact that we can rejoice right now uh, in all these things he says therefore 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 what you know whenever uh, there is a word therefore we have to look at the previous parts of uh, scripture what has been written and then we continue from there that's why the word therefore so because we are so blessed uh, he says gird up the loins of your mind so that also tells us like make up your mind because when we go through challenges when we go through struggles delays uh, when we go through disappointments discouragements of some sort the tendency is to lose hope which is why we saw the writer to the hebrews he encourages them so much Uh, and and tells them look we were we only had the shadow now you have the real deal and though you're going through persecution you need to realize that what you have is too great it's too mighty okay so encouragement why and remember he kept saying again and again like don't give up don't give up uh, i know you're not of those who will give up so uh, when we go through trials it has a tendency to bring us down and uh, in our minds we have to be clear in our minds we need this established that uh, you know our hope is in the lord jesus christ and we are not going to lose hope because 
of all the things that we just saw our identity our uh, future our you know current um, uh, you know access to god and and the status that we have in christ right now we we can rejoice in those things and be settled be very very clear in our minds not to give up and uh, he also right now we will see that there, there is a call to holy living in the scriptures that follow uh, you know from from verse 14 he says as obedient children not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance but as he who called you is holy you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written be holy for i am holy so he says look now we spoke about all these grand things that our identity is in christ and all but how do we live it out there is a life that must show it uh, which is where a sanctified life comes into the picture holiness comes into the picture we know even in the moves of god we we've seen the restorative moves of god from the 1400s and uh, there is a period where you know god uh, the holiness movement right we talked about the holiness movement where god restored uh, i think it's the 1700s where sanctification became the theme uh, in the church where people understood yeah god has done so much for us we are in christ now but there's also got to be a life which is an evidence of this inner transformation that has taken place so holy living uh, is a requirement for the believers and he charges us by what has been stated uh, you know by god uh, that be holy for i am holy god wants us to be holy why did jesus come jesus came to give to empower us the sin of the power of sin over our lives is broken so now we are empowered to live holy you know god never asks us to do i heard uh, someone say this god never asks us to do anything that he does not empower us to do because if he does um, you know that that would be quite heartbreaking that he's asking us to do something which we can never attain isn't it but that's not how god works god always gives us a means he makes it possible for us to live that life and so when there is a an instruction of god for example over here be holy we as believers shouldn't say oh it's too high a call i can't do it if we couldn't do it god would never tell us to do that it's because we can that there is that instruction be holy for i am holy we are empowered we are empowered by the sacrifice of jesus we are empowered by the holy spirit on our lives we can live holy and he also you know here he is stating uh, not conforming yourselves to former lusts so you see there is has to be a a distinction between who we were to who we are in our lifestyle in the um, outflow of our life today now if there isn't a change then you know that's that's uh, uh really sad that we are professing christ but there's no difference between how we used to live when we were in in the world and now that we are in christ jesus so even later on we'll see uh, peter talk referring to this and saying how can we have the former lusts how can we sow to the flesh you know and reap life it can't happen uh, how can we have a, a a lifestyle that is yielded to the flesh and uh, you know we are saying we are godly people no the life has to show the inward transformation must show from the outworking so that is something that he is calling us to holy living holy living um, yeah we are in christ but let that show in our lives and the same thing continues in the following section here he says and if you call on the father who without partiality judges according to each one's work conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers but by the precious blood of christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot so what is his emphasis conduct yourselves like that conduct yourselves in a way that you now belong to christ and 
Also, there's a nice uh, point we can take from here. He says, what did the blood of Jesus do for us? You know, we must speak of what the blood of Jesus did for us, isn't it? So here we understand that the blood of Jesus, it uh, redeemed us from aimless conduct received through tradition. That simply means if there are patterns of evil, if there are patterns of the flesh, if there are ungodly patterns in our in our uh, you know like our fathers our traditions and we say that hey i can't change because that's how we've always been that's how my family is that's what we are known for but when we are in christ there is something that the blood of jesus has done we are being told we are redeemed from our aimless conduct passed on through tradition so let's say for example if uh, there is uh, anger right in 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 the family line now i don't have to be that kind of an angry person full of rage anymore because yeah maybe all my forefathers had it aimless conduct they had it everyone has received it so you know such so they speak but what's the difference for me the blood of Jesus has redeemed me from every aimless conduct received by tradition from my fathers. Okay, so that's good news. So then is holy living possible? Very much because we are saying even the blood of Jesus has empowered us to live that holy life in Christ Jesus. And all this God has done for us. And then, you know, he just goes on. Uh, we, we see he goes on to talk about the, the word of God, which endures, which lasts, uh, and, uh, you know, something that we must hold on to. So what I'll do is I think I'll just stop here. Maybe I'll revisit um, uh, from verse 20, and uh, we will pick up tomorrow. Uh, for right now, I will just have a couple of minutes for discussion, if there is, uh, in relation to the subject. And then we'll pray and close. I'll take up this question uh, after the call, please. Yes, yes, Brother Lubega. I, uh, I'm sorry to disturb. I have a problem. I don't know whether it is with my computer. For a while now, uh -huh. every time I send my, my assignment using uh google doc it doesn't accept i have to write it in a in a word in, in, through different ways and then when i try to paste it again in a word it really comes when they have they are together so that's why uh -huh. i for lately i have been uh, sending pdf but when i was uh, I'm trying to answer the other statement. I saw it is reading that I should only send it in a in word. Okay. What am I going to do? Yeah, so if you've already done it, it's fine because I know today, um, I think for the online students, we have it as the, the deadline. Um, so it's fine if you've already gone ahead and submitted the PDF or going to submit the PDF for this time. But in the future, if you have a problem like this, please write us and write me a note. Uh, I will resend the assignment to you. So sometimes that works. I don't know why, uh, you know, this this issue happens on uh, Google Classroom. Uh, but the solution to that is uh, I can resend the assignment to you with a fresh Google Doc and uh, you can write into that. This happens has happened since like now it is two years. It has oh, totally strange. Huh. But to you, madam, it is happening to Even me. Even for the other. I, uh, yes. Sure. So we'll check that up, Lubega. If it's happening only to you and consistently in all courses, then there must be some problem with the settings. So we'll find out. Because one of it happens. Once in a while it happens to some students. Thank you. Okay. Fine. So no problem for now. PDF is good. Yes. Uh, yes, brother. Success. Good morning, ma. Yes. Good morning. Um, I'm having a little challenges of my course, and uh, uh, -huh. uh my last uh, semester there are some uh, courses that are uh, clear. Last mm. semester, which I did, and I was uh, when they posted the results, I. 
I, it was the third thing that I did not do the course. I did not write the exam, which I, I wrote the exam. So I don't know how is that is going to be possible. So uh, I, even after that, I still went back to e-learning and registered the course. And uh, he mailed me that I should take my exam. I went there, clicked on the right exam. The thing was taking me back. It was not displaying exam uh, uh, as uh, exam um, page for me to be able to write the exam because at this now I think that is only uh, about two courses there, which I have done before. I didn't know why they did see, but I registered on e-learning so that I can be able to do my graduate. I can be able to graduate, but it's still it's not displayed. So what do I do in such case? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So see the way. Uh, success, I will mute you if you don't mind because my voice is echoing. Uh, yeah, it's just for ease of hearing. Yeah, so on eLearn, uh, one needs to complete the previous sections, and only then eLearn will unlock the next section. So if it's not opening for us, it's likely that some portion is left out in the previous uh, video lectures or um, you know uh, knowledge uh, knowledge checks or some of the assessments that were given for us so that could be the issue so you will have to go and review uh, uh, success and uh, once you have gone over all the sections thoroughly elon will automatically unlock the assignment to you so this is what you would need to do. Please take time to review if something is left out. So that might be the, the uh, issue over there. So we, what we'll do is let's just uh, close off with a word of prayer. And then uh, you know I can address the question that Subhashish has here on the call. Uh, I just want to request one of us in the class to please pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day, for the gift of life you've given to us and the gift of salvation that you've given to us, Lord. We thank you. We know that, Lord, you called us for a purpose and we are also at ABC Bible College for a purpose, Lord. As we are in the eve of our lectures and in the eve of our classes, Lord, we call upon your blessing to bless both those who are in the faculty as our lecturers and all those of us who are students, Lord, to get the energy, the zeal, and the will to complete what has to be completed so that we can graduate in peace, not in pieces. And if we happen to graduate in tears, let them be tears of joy. I do pray in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Lubega. Thank you. Appreciate you uh, praying for us.